I'm way less interested on in this conversation in terms of my art as I am interested in exacting the creative process towards wisdom. And I don't think that art is a necessary, like having created something beautiful is really not the point other than your own life or, you know, like to have to, to, to have done that tr transcendence, like we were talking about with maybe a sacred second self that you created and that you through logos determined what it is and you made habitual choices in your life that could get you towards, uh, you know, to have this soft focus on yourself. You, you just... But I mean, learning fun with learning. He is creative. He is artistic. I've always wanted to fight a desperate battle against incredible odds. Experience teaches slowly, Robin. Yeah, so, so narrative is in our culture, you were saying. And then you were using this example of he's a solid guy. Yeah, so like, the, like when we talk about personality in our culture, so much of the language is about solidity and like he... Yeah, yeah, so he's a solid guy. He's um, and personality and the sort of the sort of right fittedness to the world is a much more liquid metaphor would be would be appropriate, right? Liquid, that's more mature, right? Cognitively flexible and yeah, that's right. Like openness, flexibility. Um, yet when we talk about the quality of a person, it's you know you you, you would. For the most part, you say that they're solid, they're dependable, they're solid, they're they're hardcore, right? Uh -huh. um, and that is a real deficit, right, in terms of growth and um, openness and empathy. Like, how can you have those fucking things? <laughs> core, you know, when the, the core is solid, it's like, well, you're going to defend this core against what? reality like against new information against um yeah, yeah against vulnerability against love like you know against the way that nature actually works like what are you doing um well these and, are two fundamental distinctions and um you know the big five personality openness and conscientiousness and have you heard of that before keep going i think I, it's ringing a bell over here. yeah so so um there's a really like 150,000 cross-cultural, well-replicated thing in psychology called the big five. And it's openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. And you can collapse that down. Those are five factors of personality. So um, someone that's really like stubborn about change could be very high in conscientiousness because, or, or so high in conscientiousness, they just don't let new things in. Or like, so low in agreeableness that they disagree with change almost naturally or or as a reflex um and someone else can be very high in openness and they're like oh new evidence new new idea new and so those five factors collapse into two factors when you look at the science where um it's essentially being open right uh reciprocal opening uh yeah. relevance realization outward and and reciprocal narrowing like narrowing down and yeah. like so it's kind of cool what you're saying and, and we we get rigid like over time if you had 100 people and 50 of them tried to like grow their their range within themselves and 50 never thought about it or tried it's good to kind of expand out wherever your natural range is uh because if i'm born super conservative and i go oh I don't like that new idea as a reflex. That's kind of good in some ways, right? Because you don't want culture just redesigning itself every eight hours. You go to get the mail and they're like, we're done with that. We use the laser postcard now. And you're like, oh, I have to learn the laser postcard. Um, so, <laughs> you know, conservatism and, and yep. uh, conscientiousness and those things pulling back, that keeps us stability. But if you're too stable, right, you never open up to new things and nature is dynamic. So if you were always good at catching frogs and all the wolves ate the frogs and now the snakes are back in season because they're they were being preyed upon by the frogs, 
then you need to update and change and and honor that. So it's it's a it's like a fundamental dynamic of reality. And if you're too rigid in either direction, um, so as as we're talking here in <laughs> terms of our own cultural malaise, yeah, yeah, this ideology idea, this ideological thing, this slightly narcissistic you know, uh, defensive mechanism, you know, in support of your narrative uh, at the expense of other input. Um, Because you're not wrong that a a conservatism is an important element of fittedness. Yeah, I don't mean politically. I'm not saying like... But but those things are mapping... Oh, 100%. Perfectly, right? I mean, and I'm sure the science would back that up, right? Like you could look at openness and closedness in terms of a political spectrum right mm-hmm. um and I, and I don't even i don't think either side would disagree with that a conservative republican or whatever would yeah, sort of yeah, say yeah. yeah man we need tradition we need you know and uh and someone pr- progressive would say well the traditions suck and they're patriarchal so we need to change them, right? right so, it's like, so they, I, if this isn't i don't think um it's unnuanced both are unnuanced sure that's right and and neither of them are if I, I think I can't speak for anybody else, but I think both sides would agree with that assessment. I'm not, yeah. I'm not challenging or like, I wouldn't be upsetting anybody. Like a conservative, right. would say, oh, we need traditions. Of course we do. What are you, an idiot? And then the, the, the pr- pr- progressive would have the other point of view. So I'm co- I'm complimenting both sides. I hope with that assessment, and I think in both cases, as to your sort of insight, they're foundational and fundamental to the actual way that the world works like you when need, they work well yeah like yeah. you kind of want both systems you need both bo- both systems in some kind of tension um and uh, i would just my assessment or diagnosis of our culture is that um somehow um this conservative um ideal lot has has come up in our uh, consciousness is like slightly narcissistic, slightly ideological, very quick to define oneself at, as um, as unique and outside of <laughs> yeah. flow, right? Like this is a solid thing. Like I'm a solid dude. Therefore, I hold on to my beliefs and you can count on me to have mm-hmm. an opinion that will be consistent because I'm a solid dude. Yeah, loyalty is a is loyalty. a value within the conservative personality type, yeah. Well, but but see this is where like so let, let's say in the scientific community which I for the most part uh, I think you would they would consider themselves like liberal and even progressive like if uh-huh. you're, studying at Berkeley or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they're fraught with the same slightly narcissistic, ego-driven... Well, that's what I was going to say, yeah. So it's like, oh, isn't that interesting? Like, um, we've got... There's some kind of um, grammar in our cultural language that has given that stance in the world great efficacy right like you get you get promoted in your domain if you're slightly narcissistic slightly driven yeah. slightly defensive of whatever bubble whatever ideological bubble you enter your job now is to defend it hold on to it promote it make everybody see how shiny and clean it is yeah 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 it's and very rewarded every you know every sort of counter um argument and so every good scientist I know is yeah. in sort of a bit beleaguered, right, by the institution and by the cultural norms of their space. Like they're they're mm. fighting ideologues. Well, it's a their- kind of demonic possession to use religious language. When you're so um, blind to the truth, you become parasitic to the truth, to beauty, to change and goodness, to all yeah, those yeah. things, and um, yeah, it's, 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 um, there's a project I'm working on and they've talked about this and I do data analysis for it. And it's so interesting because scientists can benefit from wisdom training and humility training, like the whole thing. Um, and 
yeah, getting all these, like, I almost, like, the metaphor of, like, Humpty Dumpty, like, he fell apart, like, our culture, like, fell apart, and now we've got to put it back together, and, like, the wisdom idea, like, ecology of practices, people, you know, such as John, people such as, um, are there any other people in the space that you, like, on YouTube or on social media or anything that you learn from or like a lot, and then that's yeah. kind of like John? Um, I, I've just watched something by Ian McGilchrist that I'm. Oh familiar. right, people love him. I love him too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm. He he resonates with me. Um, and there's a lot of people in other domains. So like, I'm, I'm a political guy. So I there's there are certain and I it's funny. I'm watching some of my heroes in the political domain get sucked into what I see culture war stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I find it's kind of disappointing because I know them to be wiser than that, but yet they they get it's so seductive, right? To be in that world and to get really angry at the world. And I'm like, I wish you could just stay a little bit above the fray, right? I mean, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Like to be above the fray like so that you can criticize both sides equally without any adherence to the culture war. Like I don't cuz it yeah, yeah, no, I know exactly. I feel, I feel like if I have a skill, like I, I was being humble before, and now I'm going to be the opposite. Like, I, you know, like well, stay I, humble. You can totally. But just like, I feel like I've got a fairly good nose for people who are ideologically driven, slightly narcissistic, slight. You know what I mean? Like when yeah. people get caught up in, you know, ad hominem stuff, and, and yeah, yeah. And sort of negative stuff and like it's really serious about some minutia you know it's like now i get real serious about global warming or you know something like big you know like holy fuck the ecology of the planet like you know you'll you'll see me get very passionate but i'm not gonna get that passionate about i don't know like some oh or your sort of yeah part. this is like shakespeare thou doth protest too much when they're right. just going wild about something that no one should care about it's revealing their like ego monster a little bit yeah 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 Ooh. anyway so i i mean i think that that is a domain that i have some um facility in it's just like i've always been interested in sort of finding a slightly lofty sounds arrogant but separate <laughs> perspective right like just like a soft focus on all of it right like I are don't... you a contrarian by by nature in a lot of ways or or is that separate just i'm curious no no i mean i a contrarian makes it sound like i'm looking for an argument i i'm not afraid of an argument but i'm 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 equally interested in someone telling me something novel interesting new that will smash my previous ideas like I yeah like I, I'm so I'm on the other side like if someone tells me something that's like challenges my worldview and it seems to be coming from a place of uh you know good faith and you know mm -hmm. and a knowledge and understanding I'm like I'm literally excited like I, I'm like whoa like that to me is a it's, it's kind of like oh, an wow, experience yeah. it's like oh like add that to my schema like that will that that's going to be challenging like i'm going to plug that into you know my 50 years of of schema building you got something novel bring it on right um uh, oh this is great that and yeah so so this sort of like dia i did the dialogos thing with uh with john like uh in the summer yeah yeah and um this idea of sort of training humans, you know, for to get away from debate. Contra, like, yeah, people you, love you, debate. You, my right? point, you will you will succumb to the brilliance of my argument. Like, that's a fucking dead idea, man. That's a bad idea. Like to have that as the starting point, like like to in schools to have debating clubs. It's like, well, it's good to get students to think outside of their perspective when they have to start to debate the that. perspective they don't like. Because I work with high schoolers and sometimes they'll tell me they're in debate clubs and I'm like, oh, have you heard of Plato and Socrates? And and we start talking about the Greeks. And I think there's some some students that like I'll uh, 
they won't be so like uh look at it as like a gladiatorial battle they do want to win but they don't look at it as like oh but i'll sacrifice caring about the truth so much and i'm open to because that is a way to expose people to say oh maybe the earth is flat let me try and find five points for that and even if i don't end up believing it that activity of doing it is really Um, good so but i know what you mean like people that just want to it's like um there's this cheesy dating advice of like when you're late for picking someone up for a date and there's two reactions kind of broadly they can get really upset at you or wonder what happened and then judge after and it's like you want to date that person in category two that's not like what and then you're like Oh, my mom fell and I was trying to help her before I left to pick you up for the date. So right. let's figure, let, I wish you would have known that before you hated me because you did all these things and then you yeah, yeah, yeah. pre-categorized me and stuff like that. So sure. yeah, it's, it's um, but that, that kind of person that's already ready to go to war to defend their idea before they even heard your case. Right. Um, no, and I thought, I thought your, uh, what would you call that? Your um, defensive debate was was excellent, right? Like that. If that's what we're getting out of debate, being able to step into someone else's shoes is sort of a game of sort of empathy, trying to understand how someone could think otherwise than you already do. Like, bang on, I'm all over that. I guess the con- the um, the concern I have about the the concept is that it's it's like win or lose that the concept of engaging in truth finding is a game of uh, slice and dice, like destroy your competition, you know? It's like, and and I guess the reason it concerns me is because I see the results of that all over the internet and all over academia and all over, you know, my domain in in school. Like it's, uh, as opposed to this dialogos, which is, I think just a very graceful and truthful um, example of the opposite, which is like, no, no, let's, let's get together in a room and try to build something together. That's going to have a life of its own. And I need you to help me get closer to the truth. Um, Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's like, so it's, I'm trying to kind of bring it circular, uh, circle back to how efficacious that would be in the domains of political debate in the oh, yeah. of in the domains of whatever we're doing. If we had culturally assumed that the game was not one of victory, but one of logos, like that would be a wonderful victory for the species. Right? Like if we could, if we could, if we can shift that, um, and then it has the it has the denarcissification and de-ideological vocation, if those are words, of of our culture, because it's like a narcissist isn't interested in um, building something with someone else in equal recip- reciprocal growth, because where where's my you know where's my specialness in that? Uh-huh. Oh, which is it's exactly what these people that can't see the mitochondria vacuole are doing like yeah, yeah. Oh, Heidi this is my friend I don't want my Heidi to, to, to be the one that finds the new special thing because she's not me I want the glory for having oh so, yeah that is the grossest like the that's part of the problem of getting credit for your scientific discovery is like oh, it's Broca's area, and it's this person's, it's like, couldn't we have named it something that made sense in relationship to the whole that it was joining, rather than like, oh, that star is the the Rob star, because Rob right. found it, and there's Kevin Moon, and it's like, oh, now it's so confusing, because I have to memorize these dead people's names eventually to know right. the galaxy, and yeah, the, the, yeah, people, people that are so in it for the ego, um, it's powerful, right? Because uh, people like workaholics that will sacrifice all their free time and energy to like get the reward and end up pleasing society 
with all their energy. Like it's kind of nice for people like you and me that just want to relax and let people innovate all the time and run things, even though it's like burning them out and horrible. Um, so there is something about that drive that can be harnessed positively. If you're like, oh, the way I'm gonna get my value is to show society that I'm worth something and make society better. But then it gets hijacked by, and I'd like to hear my name more. Can you guys just say my name a little more often? Um, yeah. Yeah, the, then there's no center too, like in the political realm. Like I'm, I think my view is I like a lot of things of, of all parties and different things at different times. And I've changed. I used to be really anti like welfare is for the lazy and wasteful. And I go, oh no, like I've met enough people that are suffering that can't just go, oh, I'm going to get a four year degree right now and become a uh, information processor overnight. Right. Um, and like, let's help those people because they're human beings and it like keeps society better. Like if people are just falling through the cracks as you walk to work every day, if you're just in a crappy world. So right. for both of those reasons, like, oh yeah, let's, let's not be so critical of every new spending bill that helps people for no economic gain. Um, whereas the, I used to be like, if you time traveled, you'd be like, oh, Rob's as libertarian like the, the budget should be as small as possible right, right. always um and well that, yeah, that's you, right i mean that's that's exactly what we're talking about right like that this like willingness to flow with data right and right right yeah I go oh that's kind of right, a good like, idea to uh you know and i guess you know to bring this sort of uh creativity stuff into it um, to me, this is what creativity can practice, right? Is this sort of, because creativity doesn't, the act of it is reciprocal and it's in a sort of a dialogos creating space, right? It's about logos. It's about the fire. It's about the energy of you interacting with the materials of the world. And if you can, I guess, I guess my goal with that in that domain is to, parse apart the parts of the process that are exaptable into this very domain how can we train with creativity a way to um soften the focus of people on their own egos a little bit and um yeah i think i think there are lessons in the creative process that could be operationalized in the you know, de-narcissistification of an institution, like that you could, you could have people see the efficacy of um, a worldview and a stance in the world that has aesthetic quality, that will be joyful, it will be slightly vulnerable, it will be, um, and, and, it, and it'll have results, right? You'll, you'll come up with cool novel ideas and they will be celebrated in kind by other people who also enjoy, you know, aesthetic cr creative consciousness. And then if we could just sort of create a culture in which those things are celebrated mm -hmm. um, and not, def you know, um, I think it would sort of turn down the ideological uh, volume a little bit in our culture and uh, allow for openness and you know wisdom cultivation I think um so yeah that's sort of my task I feel like right now is trying awesome. to figure like I I'm pretty good at teaching the creativity and I I have like exercises or whatever and you know um success in sort of doing some things but I'm it's sort of novel for me yet to sort of like pull on those threads and and attach them to um, areas of our culture that are um, could use awakening, right? <laughs> they could use like uh, that that are part of the meaning crisis. Let's say like part of the doldrums and uh, you know anxiety and um, sadness, you know, in our culture. Like, how can I plug in? aspects of creativity that poke at and enliven those aspects of 
individuals and hopefully cultures and institutions. Um, that to me feels like my new work. Yeah. So, so tell me more about this. So, so if you were, if a college said, oh, we want to run a certain amount of time course, because this sounds awesome. And we want some of maybe our faculty or our students to experience this and, and start to, because I studied like learning and, and training and, and like it's, and John mentions this in his series too. It's kind of cool that we can notice we're lacking something and then skill up and then re-engage with the world as like a new person. So it's really cool that, that it's very hard to do as you scale up though, because like you're saying, if you want to change an education system at one school, you go, oh, this is easy. I'm just going to show these 10 skills and they're going to practice. But then it bumps up against, oh, well, this teacher hates it. Oh, actually, the administrator hates it. Actually, the administrator's boss, the way that they measure the administrator's performance discourages it. So you actually run into all these barriers that were invisible until you tried to start affecting change in the organization. Well um, said. So what's what's like, what and was it, something that you've either done yeah. before like or what's something that you could imagine where someone would plug into something like that? yeah no, that's a good question I, and I, you know um you your insight there is is apt i mean I, I i have done some professional development stuff on on that front with teachers and i would say that individuals get really high on it yeah yeah okay this is great uh, I, on some level, it's, it's a lot to ask because, you know, they see it as like, well, that's really cool, but, you know, they're busy. They got kids, they got yeah, 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 yeah. They're teaching this thing. And it would be like, to me, it feels like not a huge, I, I try to make you know the steps small enough that it's, oh, cool. it's a viable future, but it's, It is very hard to move an institution. It is very hard to get all of you know. So if you're asking me how I would do that, I, I'm afraid I don't have <laughs> I don't have a, a real solid like. Oh, I would just step in and uh, uh, you know I would give these pointers and the and a, a culture will see the wisdom of creativity. Um, well, what is that catch fire of the individual part? Like how? Because how, there's definitely people that maybe wish they could do that but can't and you you've made people you've helped people see yes um oh this this is that so what's that like like how long does that take i'm not trying to over quantify you or anything but like yeah. what would a uh well so, look like or so yeah i mean to, to bring it into the individual scope yeah, like yeah. That, that's where i feel like um hopefully you can you know hit a bunch of individuals and in that that will help them transcend a little bit um so uh -huh. My experience with doing it with students, you know, if, yeah, so I, you know, in a, in an hour long class, I can bring students through an experience and a certain percentage of that class that would be palpable will, can have an experience where they'll go, wow, I didn't know I could do that. Like that, my brain did that, or they went, they go into some part of their consciousness that builds something novel and strange and weird it's not necessarily beautiful or you know like it's not like they're they've attained some artistry or something but they have had an experience of doing something that stretches their own sense of their own potential that they that what they thought was sort of a well, right. It's like, I, I, I think the feeling is from, you know, some feedback that you get and you just sort of feel it in the room is, oh, my, the parameters of my potential just shifted just a little bit because it's mm -hmm. like, there's a self-definition, like I'm not the creative one. Like I, I come to English class say, and you know we're gonna read a book and you know i'm not really good at english and you know whatever i'll get through this or you know i'll be i'll do the dutiful student role or whatever and that i can surprise them in an hour and have them have their brain do something that was legitimately strange and slightly bewildering and novel and they'll kind of giggle 
and go, whoa, check this out, right? Mm -hmm. I did that, right? And I just think, I think that's golden, man. I think that, you know, that, and because like as a teacher, it's, it's a really privileged space, right? So like I get to have that early with them and then I'm with them for a semester, right? So we, I can really try to have them reconfigure their sense of the, their own potential and of, you know, the utility of their consciousness, right? Like, oh, I can bring this kind of weird wild mind to bear on, on, well, first on a pen, say, to write something crazy, but then I try to blow it up a bit. So, well, life has um, got that kind of openness to it. Like, you can, you can, you, you can shift your, you know, like there's all the materials in your world, like, oh, I got my mom and my dad, and I live here, and I'm going to go to university, and, you know, my friends, like, that's what I'm really interested in now is like going, how to, to live an aesthetic life to live a creative life would be looking in the materials of your world with that kind of playful rapturous flow so that you can not fall into the nearest groove and just ride it because that's what the cultural ideology is suggesting that you do right you know we're not just writing a five paragraph essay with the thesis and an outline oh yeah. oh yeah that, that's like doesn't it just it's heartbreaking that that is is part of our how we train kids because it became in some moment it became like it's much easier to do these very standardized simple things and again i told you last time i work in this industry and um rather than fail by trying to be creative and actually like taking a risk and and not being uh this this robotic mechanical thinker that's like, oh, I got straight A's. I don't know if Canada uses the A system. I got yeah. all the highest marks yeah, yeah, yeah. because I followed the algorithm um, <laughs> correctly. And then when I was 25, I'm hopeless because I didn't learn how to live. Like I have no concept of like the capacity, like you said, like it's uh, my friend Nathan introduced me to um, uh, like those artificial wall climbing. Do uh, uh, you have those where you're at? a climbing gym kind of thing yeah yeah and i went to one near me and he's like i they make you take a little like 15 dollar course and he's like you're gonna see yourself do things you've never seen before it's the best and i was like really open to to what he was saying and really trying to just like take in the whole experience i was like and then i saw it i was like holy crap i climbed this same kind of stupid little wall Right. four or five times and by the end i was seeing myself more nimble and making different decisions and accessing this whole different perspective of my mind and it was like a rush it was so fun yeah and and it was embarrassing like if i i watched people that were like 10 climb upside down and do all that and they're right next to me and i'm like an overweight adult and i'm like oh i'm gonna go to the, the little simplest one and barely do it but I, I pushed beyond that and it was awesome and then you start to admire the playful youthfulness in everyone else and you can really appreciate the dedication to the people that really stick with it and all those other kind of things but yeah the the there's something about seeing yourself and feeling that that going beyond whatever your self-image is right you can't learn propositionally you can't just say oh rob be more than you are or whatever. Yeah, right. Exactly right. No, that, that's that's right. And I've and so I've started using like more and more of John's language in in my classes. Like I was I was using Dewey's language for 20 some years. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Creativity. Yeah. And, you know, and I've just been it's been kind of interesting to watch me just and I don't I don't plan these things. I'm just like riffing. And then John's language is coming out. So I'm talking a lot about transcendence and reciprocal, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Like, like, and like, so I'm, I find myself as I'm introducing the course is like, that this is really a course about transcendence and open. Oh man. And uh, Can you imagine someone in high school telling you that when you were that age, like, oh, this, this semester you're learning transcendence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, um, and then we, so yeah. I, I like actually, your bravery is what I was trying to oh, say there. I was riffing and I remember there was a section from something Verveke did, which the, the kid, 
who has the five candies or whatever. So, the, so it's a psychological experiment, developmental psych, and it's just oh, like, right, like delaying gratification. Is that what you mean? No, it's sure. um, the experimenter lays out like one, two, three, four, five candies in front of a kid. So that and counts them. Okay, here's five candies. One, two, three, four, five, and here's five more candies. One, two, three, four, five. So spreads it out on the table this big, and they say, which which, which line do you want? these five or these five and the kid always picks the bigger five you know the eight-year-old's like i want the bigger one right and you can do that with liquid you can say these are exactly the same i'm going to put one yep, into yep. a broad one one into a tall skinny one. i want the tall skinny one because the thing that's salient to them is the size not the not the number right mm -hmm. the, the number's too abstract it's like there's more candies because it's a bigger line yeah, right yeah, yeah. How can the small be equal? That's like a Socratic point. He's like, sometimes the small is big relative to other bigness and other smallness. And by the end of like 10 lines, you're like, what, Socrates? Huh? You're like that kid that can't discern equality right. between two different equal things. Right. But the point of this of the story when I'm talking to a bunch of teenagers is like, you know, 10 years ago, you were that kid. And you mm -hmm. would have picked the big, pick the big one. Now you know there's no difference, and you would just take whatever. So you've developed, you've transcended. So there's an example of transcendence. You, you know, you can do it. You could, you, you did it. You transcended yeah. all the time because right? you were that kid. Everybody was that kid, and now through no real precise effort, you just right. cognitively gained enough realization to transcend the salience of that size. And now you know that there are other things that are salient, like the number. And so you're hip to that. So the, then the question becomes, well, as a teenager, like as a 17 year old, here you are, what, what is the next step? Like, so you've already done it from here to here, from eight year old to 17 year old. So now we're 17, what does a 27 year old, what, what, where is that gap? Right. What could you transcend from and then, you know, and then what would you like to transcend from where you are? Like what what is the project in your life that you think extrapolating yourself out of like 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 what patterns and potentials do you see that are like. You know, and then this I this idea of like visioning like like. You know that idea of like a sacred second self, like having a having an image, maybe a sage like image or like a like. Um, so using creativity to see what uh, a transcendent version of you would be like, where what cognitive skills, what life choices, which way of being your stance in the world, how would that shift to arrive at that space? Yeah, how do you do that? Are you dialoguing with them or what are you? Uh... Yeah, so I, I would say. So, for instance, I would have them go into sort of a dialogo space with a with a partner or a group of three or four. I'd say, OK, maybe I get them brainstorm really quick. Like, think about like five people in your life that you really admire and they can be fictional. They could be, you know, YouTube celebrities or they could be your aunt or they could be your neighbor. Like, I don't care. Just yeah. like. Pick five people you think are pretty fucking awesome that you admire, that you you sort of look at with a certain amount of awe. Just sort of like write those mm. down and and then like unpack that. So like, you know, it might be Beyonce or it might be um, you know, your aunt. And just tell the other person about your aunt. Like what why did you know all of the humans on the planet that you've seen? your heart your instinct your intuition chose your aunt so unpack that for each other and then have this conversation where you're like yeah you know i think she's just she's sort of different and she doesn't seem to care that she's different you know so that kind of stuff will come out and then i'll have them writing about their aunt like so so like in a wild mind like really quickly just okay take 10 minutes just write about your respect and awe for this person and then think about yourself okay so they may do another writing session about how could you take that person's qualities 
what would it, what would they look like if if you put them in your heart? Like what 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 practical things would and what would that feel like if you could do what she's doing or he's doing? You know, so to try to make it participatory, like to try to make it yeah, like yeah, yeah. To get the perspective of being. And this is transcendence. Like this is what transcendence will feel like. It, it's going to be a um, a willingness to change and having an acute sense of what would the what would the path forward feel like? What would the what would the transcendent space that you might occupy like? I, I use the idea of like fake it till you make it a fair bit, you know? Right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That can be like an that. insult to people, or it can be like an actual way to self transcend. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I think that I and this is all new for me. So, like that convers that thing I just told you is a story from like last month. Like that's that's. No, fairly I love this. Yeah, because you're you're engaging people's cognitive machinery, like John might say, in a way that like. Oh, I love that what you said that the divine double because you're we're so locked into who we think we are. We have this little image uh, right. informing our personality consciously or unconsciously. And you're saying like, no, let's let's open that up and fill it with something we value and then move towards it. Yes. Um, the imaginal. That, that's the word that yeah, yeah. Becky has used, the imaginal something. So like that you would yeah, yeah. imagine and participate in the imagination and that, that, that that's a form of transcendence. And to me, see, this is the kind of buzz that I get into. It's like, that's creativity. Like, that's what we're like. If you're an actor, what the fuck are you doing? You're doing that. You're <laughs> you're going, oh, I will inhabit this space. And we do it all the time. So, for instance, well, it's play, right? This is this play. is play. Exactly right. It's play uh, with I'm our own identity. Good at it. Like this is the this is the thing that I'm makes me somewhat optimistic, and I think is a reason that these st strategies are successful pretty quickly. Is that we know how to play? Like, yeah, yeah. Spent you know at least thirteen years goofing off and making play, like make believe, like being goofballs with capes running around the house and being you know superman or spider-man like as and a then boy, we put on this like persona all... of like the business person and forget that it's it's a persona thank uh, you that's exactly yeah. right and with that that's exactly where i was gonna go like I, okay great i, I you know Sorry. like we do it all the time like if you put on a tie and some leather shoes and you walk on a marble floor with a tie on like at someone's wedding or something Fuck, everything changes. Am I right? Like you, yeah, yeah, yeah. your spine gets straighter. You, you, I don't know. Like, yeah, no, I, I remember I first started wearing um, dress shirts for work and ties. And the day I did it, I had to go pick up like chicken wings from a grocery store and people were nice to me. I was probably projecting more confidence unconsciously. And I remember people were like looking me in the eye more and like moving and being nicer to me and stuff but like yeah just because of what i was wearing i hadn't changed i had literally you know spent 10 years becoming the person i was but like just put on these clothes and both i and the world uh, you did acted change, differently though, Rob. i mean you did right that was that that's part of this it's reciprocal like you you do change when you put on those clothes yeah it's, clothes are powerful like like drama and then the physicality of even of like yeah yeah which which is to my point, like it, like the clothes are, what are they like? They're, I think they're symbolic. That's right. That's right. This is it's symbolic play, right? And it's like and it's accessing a part of us that is. And and this is where my optimism comes from in in this creative domain about transcendence is like, we're so goddamn good at it. Like just, play. <laughs> this is great. I love it's it. Based, like it doesn't take. You literally have to do nothing. You just have to put on the clothes and walk mm -hmm. and it will change. And I, I love how you said that people were nicer to me. There was a different like. Oh, yeah, I remember even like that. I went, yeah. And you so can we take that understanding and exact it right with intention, right? So it's one thing to just wear a suit and then feel like, oh, yeah, I'm going to change my fashion and and that'll be cool. And yeah, that's great. But I think it's like my task as an educator to go, okay, if that is available to us as human animals, like this is how we are wired. We play, we participate, 
we reciprocate with the environment and we're, you know, this, this goes back to my point of personality being solid. Like, look how unsolid it is. You put on some tie and some leather shoes and you're not solid, you're, you're fluid. You just changed. It just happened. It's uh-huh. fucking magic. So can we exact that flexibility, that playful um, ability to change and give it wisdom, like sort of say, we will do this in the service of virtue, of the good, of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, because certainly it is true that to be creative is not a ticket to wisdom. You know, no, yeah, because a lot of these things are um, can be just used for any goal. It could be a power related, like a narcissistic goal. You could teach someone everything but the wisdom of what you're talking about. We haven't even unpacked a percent of it. It sounds like. But like if they then stop early and go like, oh, cool, now I can be the best business person and trick everyone out of their money and I can <laughs> con my coworkers and um, totally. yeah, sociopaths and, and psychopaths yeah, that's right. are responsible for like 90% of the pain in the world. And they're so hard to identify because they're the best at taking all of the, the beauty that you were just talking about and then like exacting it mechanically for their own gain. So that man. Um, well, that, that's right so it's a it's a date i don't think creativity is dangerous but it could certainly be used to you know, <laughs> i know what this is went into it but it's really cool because you're you're consciously saying like i want these kids i want young people or adults to to dream a better dream and to want to be happier because it really is I, I i sent you that email and i'm like oh yeah i was just singing in my car and i wrote a little poem about the beach and as long as I don't forget that that in and of itself is beauty and I don't wish it were more, then that's the best. Like there's something so profound in, in that mode of being in these kind of flow states, these aspirational parts of our nature that like, yeah, you don't want to be like aspirational till you're 80 and never do anything. You don't, you, you, there's a embodying it too, but that, that opening up to aspiring to more is something our culture does poorly in a couple of ways, right? One way is it's like super success focused. So it's like, I don't care how you get the dollar, get the dollar. That's what makes you good. And then also in like the narcissistic, we've talked a couple of times of like, oh, it's because you're so great now and like fill your ego. But when you, when you just aspire to want to be a good dad or to want to be uh, a musician, if you've never played an instrument or, uh, like you said, the contrast between the the rote five paragraph essay that every high school graduate can just churn out a thousand per year that have no existential depth, no beauty. They don't even care about those things. They're just formulaically mm-hmm. churning out this mediocrity versus like, <laughs> oh, like so there was a there was a before and after of the haiku, right? There was a a person that said, I don't care about all this formality and it has to have a b c d e f and all this thing goes, oh just five seven five and then all these people that couldn't access poetry were like oh cool i can be a poet too with just five seven five and they you know the, the 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 realizing creativity happens in a lot of different ways rather than just being like the famous composer or or you can do creativity in powerpoint i had a mentor in college and his daughter he would always say, like, she's so creative, but she doesn't see it in herself. Uh, but she makes these really cool PowerPoints in business and she does all. The, and so if you can start to go like, oh, I can be creative in, a, in all these ways, like you were saying, in these relationships with my family and the relationship with my community, then, then you're so more capable of, of having these flow states, of solving problems more flexibly, of deepening your relationship with yourself in yep. some kind of way and that that can be taught and that can be experienced quickly in a kind of visceral embodied like you were saying it's not like i got an a in my creativity class like for a semester i felt more creative i saw myself doing things that at the beginning of that process i didn't even identify with or think was were possible and now all of a sudden i you know, because because 
it's weird as as a educator or as a parent you have a lot of kind of influence on your kids until they leave the nest so it's like there's these kind of key moments and then there are adults that are attracted to this stuff that go oh teach me kevin how to be more creative but most people don't even wonder about that stuff if not for people like you or john shining a light on you like oh anyone can do this i was telling you about my friend karen and in her i think 40s or even 50s she took this art class eight times because she wanted it and she found a teacher that could give it and she just poured herself into that and internalized the principles did all the homework made i'm sure just tens of thousands of mistakes and good things and bad things and uh but eventually now she can paint and she, you know, has an identity through it, uh, income, the joy of just doing it. She has a new vocabulary to engage with other people who appreciate that. And it's like a lot of people, we talked about this at the very, very beginning. They kind of, once you get past a certain age, mistakes become embarrassing and you stop trying to do things you're not already good at. And you become this very narrow, I'm the straight A student or I'm the basketball player or I'm Yes. you know, the chef. And it's like, all those things are true, but also you can be uh, other things. I don't even want to name it so much, but you can be an artist. You can be a, a, you know, your writing, if it makes you happy, is already valuable. It doesn't have to win a Nobel Prize or like, mm -hmm. I love that you're keeping it in the, the local kind of level in some sense to say like, no, just do this. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. A bit of a rant, but and, got so and excited. The, it is sort of like in that conversation I had with John, there was a part of it that I wish I had had a chance or the sort of the the wherewithal at the moment to sort of guide the conversation a little bit because he was very focused on the artist, right? And he would say, I'm not an artist, you know, you're the artist. To right, tell he's me doing what you're talking about, yeah. And I, and I and I didn't have the wherewithal at the moment to sort of like do a corrective to that a little bit, like a, the idea that he's not, I, I guess there's a conflation between creativity and art that makes me uncomfortable. We didn't used to separate these things, right? I think yeah. they were kind of more closely. Like, I, I mean, so clearly um, John is creative and I don't think he would push back on that. I, I think he'd, he'd, he'd admit that, yeah, his, you know, awakening for the meaning crisis, all of this schema that he was able to put into a linear, you know, rich thing. I, I think he'd have to admit, yeah, that's creative, but he would say, it's not art. I right. assume he would say that because he was saying, I'm not an artist. You're the artist. You tell me about art. And I, yeah, I wish I had a little that, yeah. quicker of a pushback uh, or, or realignment of that because Although I am interested in art and I, I think you could call me an artist because I play music and stuff, but I'm way less interested on, in this conversation in terms of my art as I am interested in exacting the creative process towards wisdom. And I don't think that art is A necessary like having created something beautiful is really not the point other than your own life <laughs> or you know like to have to, to, to have done that tr transcendence like we were talking about with maybe a sacred second self that you created and that you through logos determined what it is and you made habitual choices in your life that could get you towards uh, you know to have this soft focus on yourself you, you just said something very I, I almost wanted to interrupt you you said something beautiful in your last little chunk there about um i don't know something about defining yourself too closely right and not allowing change you know that kind of stuff yeah yeah i've seen it in that yeah. is what the like perhaps the distinction would be an aesthetic experience right it doesn't have to be like you created a piece of po a poem or an art or a painting but you had an aesthetic um, maybe the mechanisms of aesthetic judgment and aesthetic consciousness and creative consciousness to be turned towards um, graceful living. Yeah. You know, graceful Do you remember life. John? Then, then, oh, so you're an artist. Tell me about the process of making art. 
I am interested in that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, and I was, and it was, it's certainly fun to think about, but I, I would like, and my, my answer to that, you know, what is it like to be creative, to have, make art be creative? I, I, I'm more interested in like, say, taking a syringe and putting it into that answer and pulling out the useful liquid, you know, the, that can be exacted into living. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I don't think that person necessarily has to write a great a, a song like, like my songwriting is gratefully I'm very grateful for it and it's joyful and it, it gives me a lot of meaning in life I will say that but I, I guess I guess the reason I'm riffing on this so much is because that's a big impediment right people are like oh I see where you're going yeah I see what I'm you're saying because you're writer. saying if you actually feel creativity and then box that in as only applicable to art rather than to artful living and to flourishing dangerous man in yeah because i love um yeah philosophy as as artistry of life is different than both philosophy as rhetoric and argument and artistry as ornamentation and decoration but it's like when you take the aesthetic and the like the love of the good and the true and and keep them kind of connected then there's this this logos or this eros or this creativity in your relationship to yourself to others to the like That's moments nice. you're living in and your embodied embedded and active life um that that yeah that transcend that are so discernibly more important than being depressed and making beautiful vases or whatever or or yeah. feeling right. really smart and making these essays that five people are going to read um and might even be jerks about to tie it into your biologist thing like the philosopher as ideologue is something that plato wrestles with as sophists and as the politicians right there they don't see themselves as bad no one sees themselves as bad but they could see themselves in this creative way you're saying that if if all of a sudden you were peddling bullshit in any arena for your life and you go oh my gosh no i can just bring this into virtuous living or helping you know first myself maybe but then my my relationships and my community and stuff well that's nicely said yeah and that that would be that would be transcendence yeah. it, would, it would be transcending your former you know whatever, whatever skills you'd acquired over your life and you realize you have this sort of midlife crisis epiphany that says yeah, yeah. i've been doing this in you know the pr agency all these wonderful skills and i've been using them to peddle bullshit. oh shit! yeah what a wonderful insight to have it you know midlife to say oh i can take this these same skills and steer them towards the true, the beautiful, and the good um, in my community, with my family, with you know, you know, uh, the culture that I live in. Yeah. Um, that that feels right to me because, like, but whatever sort of workshops that I might do, and you know, and it's a sort of a ecologies of practice that I hope to participate in in offering creativity workshops it's like that 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 to me would be the goal on some level yeah, and yeah. and i i mean i can teach you some tricks of the trade that will get you into a consciousness that will surprise you yeah yeah i can teach you that like that's I, i'm just like pointing to a aspect of your consciousness and going like focus on that part and let it go blah, 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 blah. And then giving you some like, oh, well, that part of your consciousness. Now let's play some more games that get it closer to opening up your personality, opening up your, you know, your um, towards some kind of joy, sometimes towards some kind of good. But it's like, yeah, it's great. It's not. It's not like I'm teaching you how to be creative. I have to think about this a bit. Like, you obviously have the tool there, right? Like, it's. Well, you like, could say adducing, John, you know, the, the root of education is adduce, and John s sorry, says what is, this sometimes. What, what's the root? E-D-U-C-E, adduce. What does that and mean? 
it means to draw out. Ah, okay. Right. So it, it says that like the good, the beautiful, creativity, I'm not creating it in you. It's there and I'm like fishing it out. Like I'm throwing a line in the muck of oh. you and just kind of trying to pull out the you know that's, the thing at the bottom. I didn't know that about a deuce. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a cool, um, cool, I think, Latin root. And it's it's um like there's something really Socratic about that too, where you're trying to meet someone where they're at and honor that there is virtue in them. It's not you like zapping people with virtue. Right. They're like, ha ha, ha. Like Pinocchio, he finally gets a little strings cut and he runs around like a person for it's not like you're but you're you're saying like, hey, you could notice this about yourself and you can learn to attune to it. And yeah. you can you can then instead of being like, oh, I caught fire, you can try to set up the conditions to catch fire. And sometimes it'll happen and maybe it'll even get better and better the more you do it. Or or like with the circling um, practices, like if you kind of come back to it every six months or do it once in a while, it starts to kind of integrate and become not just something, a small part of you, but it becomes like your second nature or something. Totally. Fake it till you make it, like to make a yeah. habit out of out of these processes. Exactly right. No, no, you you're very astute. Uh, that, that... No, I love this stuff. I mean, I think about this stuff all the time. It's one of the things that that drew me to John was he loves thinking about the mind and learning and uh, also bettering and and uh, yeah, humility and all these kind of different things and and the idea that like you can practice again that separates us from other species in quite a bit like imagine if you saw a cat practicing for war that lived near you like, oh my gosh these cats we better start paying attention to them they're yeah. like throwing spears at targets every day and one yeah. of them has a little person drawn in the center it's like they don't <laughs> do that though they're stuck in their kind of instincts and they don't really i mean some creative animals do like elephants can learn things primates can discover things and, and then teach them to other primates but not to the scale that people do. I mean, we literally build institutions to afford training and learning. And it's it's so cool that, that that kind of stuff is possible. And especially like that you have some control over your fate in some sense, once you could start to kind of see yourself being a better person or being creative, then like you said in the beginning, like you can consciously say, who do I wanna be? Or even better, I love what you were saying, like, what is it that I admire about others that I could learn to foster in myself that and, and become this kind of uh, being that I never saw myself as capable right. of being. It's like, it's so much easier to have a role model. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I love this, this aspirational. Aspirational, yeah. That's right. And it's playful too, right? It's like, oh, you can, you can play at being whatever you want. Like, uh, uh, you know, so like, here's another little trick of the teacher trade that I yeah, find please. interesting. It's like, so you'll have a, you'll be talking about doesn't matter what, and you, you know, you say, well, what, what do you think about that, Johnny? And Johnny's like, I don't know, no idea. You could say to Johnny, all right, Johnny, so pretend you did know the answer to that. What would that sound like? There it is. Like, that is, it's not, oh, it doesn't always work, but it's like, that's got a high percentage rate of success for me. Like, like, just pre, don't, don't pretend you know, act like, you, what would it sound like if you were someone that did know? So I'll even use the word bullshit. That's just so clever, yeah. Bullshit me. It. Just give me an answer that's just bullshit, you know, about, I don't know, some Shakespearean text. It doesn't matter what it is or what this yeah. might mean or whatever. And oh. if you do that, you outflank the, you know, I think that I'm someone who doesn't know. I'm, you know, whatever. I'm a lazy guy. I'm not really into English class. Uh, I don't want to look stupid in front of my peers. What, oh, yeah. Whatever. Whatever the story self-definition is, it's just a it's just like it's like you could take a ice pick to an egg and go and it's like, oh, 
that shell broke easy, you know, <laughs> it's like that whole self definition that limited the thought is just wafer thin. And then that person can start bullshitting me. I, I do that. I, I talk, I, I use the word bullshit quite um, openly in my classes. And yeah. I talk about how useful it is as a, as a mechanism to uh, get flow going, right? Just bullshit me for a bit. Just talk, talk, talk to me about, you know, and once you get rolling, man, like, I don't know. I just, no, no, this is beautiful because I think this actually enhances John's, John's kind of tradition or whatever John's ideas, because he, he frames bullshitting as self-deceptive, but why would it exist if it didn't also have a positive benefit? And the positive benefit is it allows you to like leap outside of yourself and Mm -hmm. take a, he will talk about describing things in the first versus third person. And I've done this and there's research in it. And if you say, okay, well, yeah, you can't stop your habits of overeating. I'll just use, like, I I have horrible relationships with food sometimes, Uh, although they're they're getting much better, just to be fair to me. Um, But like by saying like, well, what would you tell your aunt to do if she was in that situation? I'll go, oh, I can picture my aunt and I don't have these same hangups with her as I do with myself. And then I can start to, and then you go, oh, but that could be me. That doesn't have to be her. And, and I love what you're saying. You're like, well, just, just lie to me. Just totally, even if you don't feel confident in you saying it, just lie about it and see what happens. And then all of a sudden, uh, the other trillion brain cells, besides the eight that were defending the ego, uh, fly out. And they're like, oh yeah, there's, there's, there's a 20, I had a, a college professor who said like, He'd say, oh, come up with some examples of this, this concept. And we go like, oh, we can't do it. It's so hard. Why are you making this thing? He'd say, no, you could do it at 25 examples. Like, I'm asking you for three. Like, you could, if you really tried, you could list over and over and over again answers to this problem. But we're so caught up on, like, I can't do it once that we don't get beyond. Yes. Um, and I, I love what you're saying. Like, just lie to me. Because there's something um, playful in mischief that right. if we let that mischievous part of us out. Um, it's like a very Zen uh, idea in some sense. Uh, it's interesting, right? And, oh, then, and, then, yeah. and then the ultimate goal would be to have that in your sort of tool um, toolbox. Is that the right word? Yeah, the, like the toolbox of life. It's like when you find yourself in a situation maybe with your girlfriend or your partner you feel like you're being somehow mistreated or whatever it's like but you find you feel find yourself mealy mouthed and you don't know what to say about it or how to act it's like oh i remember a, a strategy pretend that you do that i do know what to do mm-hmm. right or talk to your aunt about it or whatever you know some psychic little trick some some sort of mental gymnastics that are available to you. And so here we are exapting it into the intimate parts of your life, like using creativity for a virtual engine to create virtue for yourself. And it's, what is it? It's, it's a tool in your toolbox of, of good living. Um, and so if we can make a habit out of doing those little cognitive tricks so that, and to me, that's transcendence. You just, you just transcended because otherwise, if you didn't have that tool, you would have stayed inside your self-definition. You would have. Right. This divine yep. double thing that you, you brought right. in so elegantly. is like, no, there's a, a you that could exist right now. If you would just kind of give it the creative life, like the breath of life or whatever to, oh pop out and go oh let's let's not even argue about this thing let's go ice skating instead or um, right and then all of a sudden instead of being fixed in this identity um like john john might say the moreness of 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 anything right everything is so multi-apt so multi-perspectival that we assign it an identity and assign ourselves an identity but then we don't realize that whereas if we realize how multi-dimensional ever, ourself, other people, reality in general, and then just start to try and play with that. Like you're saying, it's like, oh, just realize that's an option in your, uh, I love, we keep using this toolbox analogy. It's like, yeah, in your little 
you know, uh, what does Batman have that belt with all yeah, the different the utility belt? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that's, like you have the the uh, perspectival shifting, self generating, uh, you know, stick or whatever that's in pocket number three of of totally. your, right next to the batarang. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, and you know what? I mean, so part of like you're obviously a creative person so there there you are you come up with this cool metaphor of the ba of the batman's utility belt if you were my student and we were talking about that stuff i would have you draw that belt okay yeah, why yeah i would i would i have these things called creative scrapbooks and like i i got a million of them but you know just book yeah, like yeah. um and uh you you would you draw a picture of yourself and you'd or, or maybe just the belt, I don't know. I mean, I'd maybe say, turn your book sideways so that you can make the belt, you know, this big, so it's big enough. And then, um, so what's in the belt, sort of cognitive tricks, cognitive skills to access, to sort of like get yourself to your sacred second self. So we've already maybe had that conversation. So give me five tools and make them like, might be a boomerang of love and uh you know like i don't know what like, yeah yeah yeah. No, a, a grappling hook okay so like let's write something on the side of the grappling hook gun like it might be like um no more you know like uh let, some some habit that you have and you know you have about lying to yourself or saying to yourself that uh you know nobody likes me or or you know uh I'm just going to be, I'm just sort of a boring person. Let's say, let's say everyone thinks I'm a boring person. So right on there, right on the grappling hook gun, like, um, you know, I'm no longer a boring person or whatever. And so uh -huh. put that in the, you know, and so those, the, the reason that that would be important. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at sort of creativity as a tool of learning is by creating an image of the thing it condenses the co the cognitive load right it's like it's such a big thought to think about your deficits in life and they're abstract and, they, and whenever you think about them they're caught up with all of these other bullshit, right so so what you need to do in your consciousness is to create elegant small holdable um schema right so the gun that is now in your scrapbook as a piece of a physical thing, you can just call it up into your consciousness, the grappling gun of love or whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, this is awesome, and Kevin. It oh my God. Holds in that image of the grappling gun is your sacred second self. So there's me and there's this. And you remember, I need to love myself more or love better, or you know, and you so you now have the image. And it's got a loftiness to it. It's got a direction to it. You remember writing it on the gun. And you might even like, so I do a lot of that kind of stuff. And it would be like, okay, add color to it. What color is the gun? What, wow. What's the shape of the, like, what, what, what is the, the wire made out of? Like, is it like a web thing? Is it oh, man. Like, and and force yourself to think about it aesthetically slash emotionally uh, you know like what why are those materials important I, something like that right i would so we'd be having this sort of conversation and ho hopefully what i would have accomplished in my class is that you know 26 people are doing a similar like everybody has their own utility belt or the, maybe they don't have a utility belt but they have another but they get practiced at doodling in their scrapbooks and making metaphors out of the important shit in their lives like like drawing it coloring it creating emblems creating metaphors that are shortcuts for their they're monomic games, right? They're monomic pieces of wisdom. What's monomic mean? Oh, monom uh, to help you remember. Oh, mnemonic. Did I pronounce it wrong? Mnemonic? Yeah, yeah. Isn't it spelled M-N? Yeah, but the M is silent. 
Oh, no, okay, no, no, mnemonic. Okay, yeah, yeah. so mnemonic uh, tricks, right? Like that, wow. and it has this qual. And this is where aesthetic experience and creativity is so important. And this is it makes elegant consciousness. It yeah, makes yeah. It, it 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 creates schema, right? It 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 lowers your cognitive load because it organizes your thoughts into smaller and smaller images, right? Right. So, so, you know, imagination, which is what I'm asking you to do is play with your imagination, has the word image in it, right? It's it's about image. It's image creation. And if so, if you're with using your imagination, you can. You know, you're you've got a you've got a metaphorical brain anyways, so let's just exact it, use it to it's like I think of it like packing a snowball, like you grab all the good stuff and you put it into a smaller manageable space that now you can sort of like separate it from yourself right as opposed to it's just being it's all emotions it's all confusing it's all little, oh it's wow all, I, you just I had all, such an insight wow on your paper and you kind of look at it and say there now i can think about it. i can objectify it i can see i can give myself wow distance from this my is like religious kevin so that it's no longer just like oh it's all like all of me is in this fucking confusing thing about how sad I am. Yeah, because you're not only creating, but you're you're right. You're getting this psychological distance from yourself and then creating something that has an intense amount of meaning and then almost dropping it back into yourself as this uh, this new um, configuration of like, essence of personality that you can then um in in a real moment where life is just happening and you're not contemplating with your notebook and all these things but in that real moment then you can say oh but also i've got the uh you know sword of power that the fairy gave me and because i have the you know and i have the net that catches fairies and and all the other zelda items then instead of just being this 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 amorphous blob or this person that you've kind of become in this identity you've got this this symbol it really is a symbol in john's language or in corban's language or or because symbols what's different from symbols from ideas is that symbols can pack way more emotional meaning they almost exact our episodic memory which like if you're at a christmas party and there's all these things happening you remember the emotions of everything so you're creating this image that is using almost that episodic capacity to tap into emotional uh, meaning and semantic meaning and imagistic meaning. And it's from the self, like it's not like someone's forcing you to have it, it's from you. And then you're giving it back to yourself as this like in a Jungian sense, like a refined part, like an essence or something. Like, I don't know if you know James Hillman at all. Mm. Yeah, Hillman talks about these things like elegantly and i'm studying this stuff quite a bit in the last year um and i'm like such a novice i can tell um he's, he's into symbol and cr creating symbols for yeah he worked with young in like young's era and corban was part of the era of since the new as well so they're all together and but what you're saying is like it's so genius because or or you put a lot of effort into it. i should praise your effortfulness not your awesomeness so so all this effort you put in over a lifetime <laughs> of of experimenting with this stuff it's it's amazing because like we have all this capacity and we're in the world but like there's this symbolic aspect that you're like it's just it's right there it's right behind the ego if you would just have someone help you pull it out and inform it and then you play with it and then put it back and especially if you keep doing that over time and in reality um, you know, outside of this sacred space that might be your classroom or your journaling or whatever, then all of a sudden, um, this, this, it has like a locus, like a center to it. And it's got this energy because again, like episodically, we're so great at going like, oh, I went to Target and this was annoying and that was cool. And that was, funny and but but it's all kind of in space it's not in like a concrete chunk whereas if you exact that into an image and especially it's like an image you're working with and that you helped create yes then all of a sudden it's 
it is like this divine double. It's this little, um, mm. like a, a formative chunk of person of consciousness of personality that you can then say like, oh, help me, you know, magic bear that I created in this class, or help me, bat belt, uh, boomerang of love. I think you said, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like instead of, um panic which is like our normal reaction to chaos you actually have this extra bit of agency where yeah. in the panic you can have epictetus would say ready to hand this like symbolic thing and now all of a sudden it affords these whole new options for you and lets you kind of like oh this is this yeah, is man. beautiful kevin now we gotta sit yeah. down and and yeah. I'm do glad more of this like stoic into it right like i i, I don't know stoicism real well i did buy uh um uh one of the w w which was the, the emperor was that epititis no marcus aurelius marcus aurelius yeah his his meditations that's right i've been reading that sort of slowly um yeah and uh that really resonates with me this idea of like giving yourself space away from like you are not your emotions kind of thing. Like you are, you have them and they're important, but they're, I can't remember any specifics of it, but it's just like that ability to separate and see um, the things that feel all encompassing to give you sort of yeah, right. critical distance from your own life somehow. And I think- yeah, It's not to make you boring and feeling less. It's actually like you're like a lot of people frame stoicism as like oh now you're detached and you don't care about anything but you're saying it's to get a psychological distance from what otherwise would be intense that's right and so the the bat belt is is a tool in that game right of like oh i know myself well enough to know that i have these pitfalls good news is i have this <laughs> you know <laughs> like i have this thing i have this and i've i've i created it and it's well wrought um oh i think it gives great. you stoic distance i don't know i don't know what the right word for that is what, what well it's, they... a, it's a skill i think there's a skill of detachment and, and uh epictetus lived around the time of marcus aurelius and one of his students wrote down a lot of his works and it got i don't think he was ever a student of marcus was never a student of him but like he got epictetus's teachings um and then as the emperor of rome did all these imaginal exercises and reflective exercises and again like philosophy not as the capacity to make great treatises and arguments but philosophy to create spiritual tools and and afford spiritual development so that when you encounter life you can do it more virtuously more mindfully more powerfully yeah. um that, that strikes me as a worthy goal of aesthetic creative integration into your life like that that it feels to me a bit like a stoic has stoic potential if that's a word like that like we could exact this stuff to be to help you be prepared and guided towards virtue and a worthy life that that has you know another word i'm really i'm really keen on is authenticity right to be like all this stuff is designed to get you to the real you, right? Like to, like, because when you admire, let's say you admire your aunt or you admire Batman or whatever it might've been. Yeah. And you did that in a creative experience in my class, say, like we just talk about that. And it's an important thing about creativity is that, and I teach this like right off the hop, it's like when something in the world is important to you, like let's say you chose Batman. Like I, and I said, do, do this quick, give me five people you admire. And Batman was on that list. And that took 14 seconds. Respect that list. Like that's really important. Out of all of the universe of people you could have chosen, you chose those five. Right, right. That's but something I'm learning about too, yeah. Is, is that you are the only person on the planet you might not be the only person on the planet with that list, but that's a very short, uh, you know, all of a sudden it went from 8 billion people to, you know, 500 people that have the same list, but you're the only one of those, of that subset of people who have the same five list as you, 
who have the list for the very reasons that you do. You know, your relationship with Batman is entirely your own and it's beautiful. It's gotta be beautiful because you've lived all of these years and there's something about your relationship with that narrative that is totally unique and by God, it's important. I actually have them touch their heart. I'm always having them touch their hearts. Like, okay, so Batman's on your list, touch your heart. Mm -hmm. Like feel oh, like- this is so awesome. Like uh, mm -hmm. Batman, like whatever it is. So now we write down Batman and we start having a conversation with, you know, hopefully in logos with other people, like why your love of Batman. And hopefully I try to teach them, you know, like to get beyond the, oh, it's just so cool, this car is wicked. Like, okay, like, yeah, okay, his car is wicked. Yeah, yeah, get your second or third take. That's a little yeah, that's more right. like, so rich. Like, yeah. And I will have, I will have, you know, what do you call it? Um, giving them examples. Like I'll do it. Like I'll do uh -huh. Bob Dylan or something like that. And I'll yeah, say, yeah, yeah. Oh, Bob Dylan. I talk about Bob Dylan all day. And then I'll like talk about how much Bob Dylan has taught me. And, you know, and I'll, it, so they'll, they'll see me. Uh, uh, yeah, you're like, I've aspired and I've internalized the sage of Bob Dylan right. and Dewey. And That's right. um, yeah, I love Bruce Lee. I checked out every book that had the word Bruce Lee on it from the yeah. library, the maximum number. They have like a five limit on any book. And I was like, they're like, you can't take this one anymore because you've maxed it out. And the same thing with Thoreau um, and yeah. other people like that. And it's like, you... you you get so we've lost that intimacy of having a close role model in the mass education kind of Napoleonic education system where you have eight teachers in a day and 30 teachers in four years. You really don't ever have an aspirational real divine double to look up to and you're separated from your parents for most of the day you're really like off with these adults and all this stuff, whereas like you know if you had a great teacher for a decade, like say Alexander the Great and Aristotle, right? Alexander the Great was around this guy, Aristotle, like all the time for his whole formative life. And he ended up internalizing as much of Aristotle as anyone that's ever lived because he had this one-to-one -one relationship. And, you know, what you're saying is like, there are these, these kind of prefigured people that you already like kind of admire or a spot wish you could aspire to let me get them out don't don't filter them with like the rational judging mind like get it out in 10 seconds like just go say hi to the girl don't figure it out and wait till all the plans are in place just go do it and see what happens and then all of a sudden now it's it's out in reality and now you can start to relate to it rather than just judging it away and i love too that you're just like Look, it could be Spider-Man, it could be Batman, it could be Christ, it could be Socrates, it could be Marcus Aurelius, it could be Bob Dylan. It's not like there's a good group and a bad group morally. You're just saying, like, get it out there. Um, and then and then this this kind of new imaginal relationship, you start loading it with meaning and doing it in dialogue where people are like, did you think about that? Or why does that matter? And that forces you to, like, answer them. Um, and And like you said, adding all of these things that, that the Cartesian primaries of like weight, color, or like size, length, et cetera, like those are fine, but you're saying like, give it these qualitative and quantitative elements. And all of a sudden it's like this, this you're, you're helping people co-generate with themselves and with you, this, this part of themselves that could be viable. And um, I don't know if you remember Agnes Callard from John's stuff. No. She she teach, she has the book on aspiration that John mentions in his series. Okay. Um, he mentions her, L.A. Paul, and a few other people. I remember L.A. Paul, yeah. Yeah, and so Agnes Callard, oh. in this this talk she did, that had like 200 views on YouTube or something. Like it's a, a shameful amount of views for how awesome it was. And with John or... No, 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 with just another, another philosophy okay. professor. And she said, though, the, the gem that she said is like, you have to be able to imagine something to realize it. And it's like that step gets overlooked and or does unconsciously. It's like, oh, I just watched all these trashy celebrities for a decade in my youth. And now I'm unconsciously embodying their trashy values. Or I could aspirationally 
start to imagine this this part you know you can do this with your body i do this imaginal exercise called a giant body visualization and mm -hmm. it helps me be more embodied um so i'll just imagine you know this giant body and then you know a week later i'll come back and i'll imagine it with even more detail so like neurologically i'm like recalling it and adding to it or something like that is, it you? is the body you or is no it... it can be anybody it can be just it's like a, there's a picture that the activity book came with so it's kind of like that kind of looks like if i had to name it like socrates or like a weird person or whatever but but by doing that at some point in the activity once this, after a little while you've got a nice solid image of it you imagine it as being super spacious because it's giant a pore in a giant skin is like bigger than you so then you float yourself into the body and float around it and stuff. And all of a sudden, like unconsciously, I'm learning what embodiment is. And then you start to have the body like, you know, strangle a snake or run a lot or do like move and do things like that. So it's this whole imaginal generation where, you know, if you're a very disembodied person or you just want to be more in touch with a body you know, you can do that. And then you're floating around you're like, oh, there's a blood vessel. Oh, there's, you know, a kidney. And you start to have this whole perspectival relationship with this imagined thing. Um, but what's that called that you're- I'll send you it. It's a, it's, it's a giant body image. I do depth okay. therapy and, and learning all sorts of Jungian- um, What kind of therapy did you just say? Depth. Depth? Yeah, Jungian therapy, they call depth therapy sometimes. Yeah, I'd be interested in some of this stuff. Like I, I, um, yeah. it's funny. I actually have a deficit in the domain of like if I close my eyes and you say, you know, picture a sailboat, I I can't see it, um, which surprises people. Yeah, and I, I, I just I'm actually yeah. Christmas that there's a word for this, and my whole my whole family suffers from it. If huh. it's suffering, I'm not even sure it's suffering, and I'll tell you why in a second. But um, right. uh, but my aunt is like this. My brothers are like this. We can't do that, but I, I know others can, and I bring students through the very similar things. Like I, I call it the theater of the mind, and I'll do this. Sometimes I'll, one thing I do is I'll play Stra Stravinsky, um, the Rites of Spring, this beautiful classical piece. I don't know if you know that, but it's very dramatic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's it was actually used in Fantasia, I believe. Yes, yes, uh, yeah, yeah. So anyways, I just have them close their eyes and follow the theater in their mind. So I say, this is the sound, uh, um, the score for the film that you're going to project on the lens uh, of your mind. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want you to pay really close attention and follow it. And then we'll share some of the images. And, and then I do thought experiments, like sort of like what you're saying, like I'll have them picture stuff and just sort of have them recognize the awesomeness of consciousness. I love this. I'm very interested in using, having more of a practical resource. I'm just riffing. I I, I just made No, I think I would love to work with you and develop some of this stuff. Like I said last time, I think it's so cool that you have so much experience and passion and kind of proven ideas. Like it's, it's one thing to have a theoretical grasp on this stuff, but you've really like seen the aha moments in people and, uh, yeah. We haven't talked about it, but I get the sense that like you've seen people develop over time and stay changed and and hold on to this stuff, which again is like amazing. Like it's it's not it's it's easy to have these little one off moments, but to see someone actually change and have it stay permanent is like that's what the world needs right now, especially in service of virtue and wisdom and goodness and yeah. beauty and all those things. So yeah, I would I would love to I hear that. Um, you know maybe hear more of these techniques and capture them in recording and stuff like that and and you know like like the way other online like it's it's a may or in person like just the workshop idea or or even like a mentorship program or things like that like really seeing how can these these techniques not just make really cool podcast episodes or really nice conversations that i'm feel just uh grateful for um but actually like show other people like induce in other people um yeah. this capacity because then it's like life is so much more meaningful without
being part of the system without all your identity and your job or in one romantic relationship or whatever it is, you could just go, Oh, I'm a powerful agent in my life. Like I'm, I'm a, uh, not just a background player. You ever hear people say like NPC? Um, they're like, I'm, I'm an NPC to life. Uh, and you could NPC feel me? it's a non-player character, like in art role-playing games oh. where you talk to the innkeeper and it's like, hello, stay at my inn. And they have no personality. Okay. Um, that's like, so you're, you're giving people agency and, and this creative capacity. So yeah, um, that, I was yeah. wondering too, do you, do you dream in, in visually? Like you have dreams. Yes. Okay. So, cause I've heard other people say the same thing of like, I have, I don't have a lot of visual imagination when people say picture a sailboat, but I've also heard those same people have incredibly visual inner experiences. Yes. So, and I do. And I, so I, 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 I'm kind of amazed by it. I don't quite understand it. I didn't, I didn't understand how unique it is. It's a certain percentage of the population that has this thing. I can't even remember the name of it. Yeah. But, so I was going to say like, why it's not necessarily a deficit. I mean, it's definitely mm -hmm. like in the, you know, it's a, it's diagnosable and I guess I'm diagnosed with it, but because I have that, other aspects of my consciousness sort of take over. Well, so, right, that's right. Well, I like can it's... do this thing where it's like, okay, I can't see the sailboat, but I, I can feel the machinery like taking over even as I'm speaking. Like, I know what it would look like if I could see it. And I can zoom in, I could go, I can look at the rope, I can look at the material of the sail. But I'm using the word look, and it's the wrong word. I'm I'm intellectualizing it somehow. I I I can I can hear it. I can like if the, when the wind hits the sail, I know what it would sound like. I know yeah. what it would look like. And I think that having that has helped me uh, a lot. Like as a as a writer, say like because as a writer, I don't have the visual to riff off of. But I do have this mental machinery that's designed to make it real, more in language, I guess, right? So I get into a flow state as a writer, and I think I'm exacting all of that machinery that wasn't, wouldn't have been needed had it just been a visual picture in my mind. I've got really good at building with language the sensual truth of of the nature of reality. I can do it with words, not with visuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, so I'm, I'm kind of thankful for it because, uh, and I think, I'm not sure. Well, visual is just one aspect of anything, right? Because I do meditation training and I'll just focus on a dot or on a bell sound. And I remember one day I was doing that and I walked outside and I live in like a kind of uh, condos where a neighbor was having some interior work done and you could hear the saw like cutting on metal and I smelled the heat of the particles and all of a sudden the sound and the smell created this image and sometimes even like instead of looking at an image I'll feel the weight of what I'm looking at and it'll make it so much more real than just like focusing on the visual aspect so our brain is it's narrowing in on the visual right? or something not like it's the supreme ultimate like people all, even plato i think does this he always says vision 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 but that's an aspect of of a way we sense but we sense a gestalt we sense the object through the visual the auditory the tactile the olfactory the uh maybe imaginal intellectual like there's there's all of this and you're saying like well, my visual knob is down to like 0.5, but because of that quietness, it allows my auditory, my verbal, and all of these things like, because we're, we're really kind of synesthetic. John talks about this sometimes, and I've studied a little bit of synesthesia. And when you try to hold two senses instead of one or, or dialect back and forth, sometimes it'll be like, whoa, I didn't know I could hold anger and joy or heavy metal and violin in such close concordance but then all of a sudden you do that enough and it lets you have this richer thing so I, yeah I, I, it's, and it's like you said we we don't want all visual thinkers as a society we want people that are gifted with this tactile verbal 
um, metaphorical nature. Because, yeah, I love it. It is funny that you use a lot of visual imagery when you were talking to John. You're going, oh, we were talking about the fire, but now it's the wave. Right. Both of those I just tracked as like visual, but there's so much to fire and waves that is not visual as well. Right. Yeah, I, I do find that stuff uh, intriguing. And it, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't make me less interested in using visual stuff like you like you were talking about the big body thing like i i want to use that yeah, yeah, yeah. it's effective it works um and uh well and i love the, the other two like pardon the, me i love the other side of things like the tactile and the like you were saying color and line and yeah that's right that kind of stuff yeah yeah and always yeah when i'm having them draw stuff it's like i i try very much to say you know, whenever you pick up, like we'll have all the crayons or whatever around us when we're doing our, I call these things cr creative maps. So you build these big maps, they're just full of imagery that they've created that is designed to build a schema for all, you know, everything we've done in the course, say. And so whenever they pick up, a, like if they're going to pick up a blue crayon or marker, it's like, why blue? Like, blue has a metaphorical resonance or if you're going to draw a line between so this idea and this idea okay you could just draw a line but it's like no what kind of line is it is it is right it like, yeah get like, out of that simplistic flowing line is it line red you know does it go from red to blue right and every so th this is the aesthetic creative stuff like put creativity the aesthetic experience in logos, in dialogue, I know I didn't use these words before, but this I think this is accurate. Dialogos with the creative experience and your schema. So like when you're bringing a line in, keep on pushing yourself towards new meaning with the color. And it's like, if, if you have a red in your hand, it might work in reverse. It's like, well, I got a red in my hand. How could red be relevant to this piece of imagery or to this part of my schema so you can it's like it works both ways right it could work it's, it's sort of like that uh you know from above and from below right it's like well i've got red how is it red justifiable in in the meaning making that i'm about to do or here's the meaning that i have um i best choose red like it doesn't matter which oh this was a gem that was a gem what you just said yeah because it, it's from part the whole but also like so what is the whole asking of a new part? But also, why is this part particular to the whole? And and those are subtly different. And right, yeah, you, yeah, John, John's gift is he saw the world uniquely and put in twenty to thirty years of practice and another twenty to thirty years of being a scientist and right. shared that with the world. So we get to um, take his efforts and kind of run with it. But but you. But yeah, you're also adding so much practical experience and your own thought and inspiration and what you've seen in others and, and others. Have, I'm sure you've had amazing conversations about this stuff with other friends or colleagues or other students that go, oh, did you ever think about it this way or whatever? And um, that's that's exciting. That's where theory and practice are both affording a better life, right? Because you can live with just just a practice focus or just a theory focus, but when right. they're weaving into the life. Yeah, no, uh, that's right. That's right. And so like, I have had my frustrations with say, the way that creativity is used in schools sometimes, I don't want to sound pretentious, but it, it kind of irks me sometimes. It's just like, oh yeah, we have a, a creative assignment. like make this artsy looking yeah. if like so for instance my, my daughter went, went you know they i forget they were in some kind of art class and it was like the art was to make some letter from some you know i don't know some old person you know what would they write it was oh, like that's that. fine yeah. that's that's fine but the art part was make the pick the the paper look old so she would get like everybody was getting tea bags and like staining the paper so that it looked old and maybe burning the sides of it so it looked like parchment from you know the 1730s or something 
And she would spend so much energy, you know, I don't know what is she, 13 years old, like making it look really good. But as a creative person, it's like, as a person who is interested in using creativity for meaning making, it's like, you haven't made any meaning. You're, you're prettifying a piece of paper to make it look old. But we're misinterpreting what the potential of creativity is in the cultivation of character and you know, it's like you're not you're not adding any wisdom to the fucking planet by teabagging a fucking piece of paper especially when every fuck is doing it like every <laughs> you didn't come up with that idea every kid's like been told to teabag this thing and then and then write it in i don't know i just like no, right it's, it's 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 on the periphery instead of focusing on the heart of the matter on character character I don't know. I've always loved that. And I love that about John's work when he started, even in his earliest kind of things online, he would talk a lot about character and character from a propositional sense, even from a technical sense is invisible. It's neither of those two things. It, it's the fount of those two things in potential, but it's neither of those. And like, you're like, no, don't, don't live in like a pretty house, like live deeply and in a new way than no one's ever lived before because your life is unique and you could you have this this bottomlessness to to who you are and it's not just like the clothes you wear or the paper for the art project and and it's easy to kind of label those things as I'm creative my my notebook is blue with pink on it everyone else is black and white but like yeah that's true it's not false but but yeah but the I love what you're saying. And and I love that you keep um keep that in mind. Because it's easy to like also fall short if you think that that just making art deco, like a big canvas with red with a black dot on it, is making the world better. And it's like, no, that's a waste of talent because that's a mind that attracted lots of attention and did nothing to like the culture or deepening themselves or so am I hearing you right or is that even remotely I'm not familiar with the big red circle like abstract art is very popular okay. and it can just be like I don't know um you know kind of a balloon animal that's made out of silver and it's really smooth and it goes for like 50 million dollars and people go oh it's so shiny and big and the artist even almost mocking the world. And maybe it's unconscious to go like, Oh, it's metallic. And you can see yourself in it. It's like an image, a narcissistic image of art. Whereas that same person that created like this smooth, shiny balloon animal that allowed narcissists to like stay as children could have done something deeper and profound. Like someone with that level of talent um, could have said, Oh, I want to, you know, build a statue that's half Socrates, half Donald Trump and really make people question reality or so, you know what I mean? I mean, does that give you a better articulation? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to. I'd have to have more proximity to that artist and that art to know, I guess. I would just use my antenna to see is like, is this. shallow or is you know i i don't know i i guess i'll just refrain from having any knowledge of on on that um what one thing i am i do push back on a little bit in terms of art is that it has to have some kind of societal um like a good lesson for for the masses or something like i i i, I refuse to sort of make that the central task of art is for it to be efficacy, uh, you know, full of efficacy for, for the world. I'm more. Yeah. So here, let me show you this real quick. And so, oh no, this is even better here. Um, this guy, Jeff Koons, um, not that long ago sold. Can you see the, the, the sculpture here? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So oh, this yeah. this shiny oh, rabbit, yeah. which is yeah, like yeah. kind of, it doesn't inspire 
um, horror or make you uncomfortable. In fact, it's the opposite. It just makes you feel cute and safe and it's shiny. So you literally see your own image of this person's like mindlessly taking pictures of it. It's the most expensive thing sold. Like this is what our, like other cultures produced, you know, uh. Renaissance art. And we, we produce this very smooth, um, yeah. unnuanced, uh, childlike kind of art and it's what we love whereas the the most expensive art sold by an american in like the 1920s was this like landscape that had like a little cross hidden in it little philosopher in a nook this beautiful light shining into things it really made you go like oh crap i'm in a i can deepen my reality and and my relationship to it or I can like take selfies. There's selfie museums in the last 10 years, which are super popular. It's not like one person goes to them. Like yeah. they're, they, they're really popular. So I guess, I guess my pushback on that would be, I, that doesn't make me mad at the artist or it doesn't make me question the artist. It makes me, I, I think you're, I think we share a sort of, dismay and sadness at our culture that that's the thing that gets the attention and I, I didn't realize it was the most expensive piece of art sold by a living artist I, mean, I think that that to me is the interesting part of that piece of art yes yes exactly it, you know it, it tells me something about culture and art um, right culture yeah what, what movies are popular in time tells you more about the culture yeah. that buys them than the artist that makes them in some sense so like, I don't yeah so I don't sit there and go oh whoever that guy Coons is, I, I don't, I, I, Very I, rich I would push artist. back the idea of like questioning his agency or his, you know, he could have done better or he should do better. Like, I'm not going to put anything on that guy. Okay. In my own heart. Um, but I do think it's fascinating that that is the, um, most <laughs> expensive piece of art on the planet. And it, and it's, that I find dismaying and um and then to give Coons maybe some credit I have no idea who that guy is but if he makes me feel dismay about my own culture bravo Good well right you. so yeah sure I, I I really like your nuanced um much more much less critical I think curious perspective and and but you'll read about him and he says he makes it because people just want to live in a simple world and not deal with like the scary things outside they want a reflective surface to see their perfect faces yeah, which is yeah. very narcissistic oh, yeah yeah um, but and, i mean he, so but, i mean but that that's quite astute right i mean like no no yeah you're right his insightfulness and his capacity to create a fortune and create <laughs> objects that can be you know valued by a, a yeah. culture um i was only saying that because i wished you know people would take your art courses and desire a, a more nuanced, rich, aspirational object to adore and to buy for $89 million or whatever it is. That's yeah. like, I would love to live in that society. I mean, I guess Socrates died and he even lived in a kind of a bad society. So maybe, maybe we're in the same kind of society yeah. as him. And right, right. But a, do you know the band Wilco? Uh, a little bit, yeah. I know the name. He he's got a he's got a song called "The Devil Is Chrome." I think it's what it's called. Okay. Find that I just wish I had written really bad. He says, uh, "When the devil came, he was not red. He was chrome, and he said, come with me.'" That's this shiny rabbit. That's exactly. You know, yeah. Shiny rabbit. And maybe he knew of the shiny rabbit. I don't know. Uh, but well, and that's the myth of narcissist too, know, right? Is the evil seasons. is it's our culture that's prettifying and beautifying and 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 perfectifying and reflecting. Like that's the devil. The devil's not a red scary beast. It's it's coming to you in the shape of <laughs> Rome, fucking skyscrapers and you know perfect windows and cleanliness. That's Satan. Be very aware, you know, come I love this. Is Let's that, end on this and, and do this again sometime because I okay, think uh, yeah, yeah. that sounds good. Yeah, so hats off to Jeff Tweedy. That, that's a that's the songwriter in Wilco, The Devil is Chrome.
Uh, I, I referenced that a fair bit, and it, and that shiny object of the, Good, of the yeah. uh, uh, feels feels apt. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's uh, let's do this again, man. That was uh, delightful. Yeah, I, I'm um like I said, I would love to if if you're interested, keep developing these little exercises and your thoughts on how to engage with students. I find that all um, educationally and transformationally powerful. And, and it's so cool that, you know, Matt, I don't know, it would be so awesome if you could take like like that circling thing you went to, if you could take 100 adults, but instead of on a weekend, like on a 10 week journey or, you know, on a four week and then six months later, four more weeks and really see over time stuff develop, how uh, how this stuff could change lives and perspectives and, and uh, give people, well, new, you know, love they, batarangs and their, their tool belts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I, I, let, let's keep dreaming about that. I mean, that, that's sort of the, uh, yeah, let's, let's play that game of um, putting that into an imaginal space, right. And, and making it real. Cause that's, I mean, sort of what I want to do, man. Like I, I want to, I want to do exactly what you're saying. And I, I don't really have, a robust image of what that looks like practically and and the practical side of me is not that well developed on some level. i think that's one reason i'm very happy to have been a teacher because it's like i got to get up at 6 30 in the morning and get to fucking work you well, and that's I mean? what the community that's is, sort of is discipline it's like about, i don't yeah. about that i got I, I just privileged i got 27 kids that gotta listen to me 75 minutes a day for a fucking semester like Thank you. Right. That's cool. But when I look at my retirement and my wish to do this stuff and build to be part of an ecology of practice that actually is impactful and and people will come to it and uh, participate, participate. And I just I just don't know what that looks like. I mean, do I make a poster and put it on? Well, the let's be hungry in our souls for that place, to quote Rudolf Steiner and you know just have that hunger and and the nice thing about being part of a community is like you don't have to carry all the knowledge like maybe maybe john has some of the knowledge and i have some yeah, and guy totally. has some and you have some and totally and, and uh, learning talking. from each other is that's right part of it devil came he was not red he was cold and he said come with me you must go so I went Well, everything was clean, so precise and towering. Yeah.